In this video, we're going to talk about chromosomes and cell division. We'll start off by just briefly touching on the structures of prokaryotic chromosomes and prokaryotic cell division. Then we'll go on to eukaryotes and their chromosome structure. And we will primarily focus on eukaryotic cell division. There are two types, mitosis, which occurs in somatic cells, and meiosis, which occurs in only in germline cells. The central questions that you should be able to answer after this video are how is DNA packaged in cells and how do mitosis and meiosis differ? How do they differ in their purposes? The mechanism by which they push chromosomes around and really the focus is going to be on the behavior of chromosomes and segregation of chromosomes in meiosis because of this point. You have to understand the behavior of chromosomes in meiosis. What happens with chromosomes in meiosis is the key to understanding genetics. So this is our unit on genetics. If you don't understand how chromosomes behave in meiosis, then it's going to be difficult to put genetics together. So we'll begin with prokaryotic chromosomes. What this figure shows here on the left is an E. coli cell that was fairly gently lysed, liberating almost an intact nucleoid. All of these fibers are actually the single DNA molecule, a single circular DNA molecule in the E. coli cell you can sort of see here in the middle that there might be some sort of scaffold that might be proteinaceous that's kind of holding all of this uh, tangle of DNA together. If we use detergents can, and get rid of all of the protein, what we then see is a figure that looks like this. In fact, in this figure, they have caught the large E. coli chromosomes in the process of dividing. So this is unreplicated. I'm sorry, the chromosome in the process of uh, being replicated. So this portion of the chromosome is unreplicated. This portion is replicated. So you, we see one copy here and the other copy is here. This is an inset where it, the uh, figure has been reduced and the uh, outline of the actual DNA molecule has been darkened for you to be able to see. Bacteria divide by simple fission. So they start off with their DNA in the nucleoid. One part of their DNA, called the origin of replication, is actually anchored to the plasma membrane of the cell. And after the E. coli cell replicates its chromosomes, replication begins at the origin of replication funny how that uh, works. And after the uh, replication is complete, somehow the two origins of DNA replication have moved to opposite uh, ends of the cell. And then the cell simply grows a, a, a septum uh, in the middle, pulls the uh, two DNA molecules apart, and then we end up with two daughter cells. So this is true not just for E. coli, but bacteria and archaea. And they all have a single circular chromosome. There are some exceptions where their genome is divided into two circular chromosomes, but those are exceptions. The vast majority of bacteri bacteria and archaea, meaning prokaryotes, have a single circular chromosome. All right, we are not going to spend much time on uh, bacterial cell division at all. So we can focus on eukaryotes. Here is a diagram of various stages of packaging of eukaryotic DNA. So recall that in eukaryotes, the genome and the chromosomal DNA is uh, entirely contained in the nucleus. 
And uh, what we see is that in living cells in the nucleus, naked DNA never exists. So here on the left is a, a schematic of DNA or its various stages of packaging. And on the right column are, uh, are corresponding electron micrographs. So if you strip away all the proteins, um, then you can see naked DNA, and that's what it would look like. But again, naked DNA does not exist in living eukaryotic cells. Instead, what we see is that if we take DNA out of a nucleus uh, with only minimal disruption under gentle conditions, what we see are things that look like beads on a string. And that's because the DNA molecules are wrapped around a core of proteins called histones. And eight histone proteins form a nucleosome. And that's written here as well. And these nucleosomes are these beads on a string. So a complete nucleosome consists of the eight histones plus DNA wrapped around the histone particle. Okay. So there's about 200 base pairs of DNA wrapped around a, a core of eight histone proteins and that com comprises a nucleosome. The histones are highly conserved proteins. The histones from yeast are virtually identical to histones from people. And histones are highly enriched in basic amino acids, meaning amino acids that have positively charged side chains at neutral pH. The positive charges um, on these amino acids interact with the negatively charged phosphates on the DNA backbone and help neutralize the uh, charge repulsion, the phosphate, the negative, the charge repulsion between the negatively charged phosphates that would otherwise occur. So DNA packaged into nucleosomes have most of their negative charges neutralized because of the histones and that allows them to be more tightly packaged as you can see. So these nucleosomes can be wound around into solenoids, into increasingly higher order structures and eventually you will see something like a mitotic chromosome that is fully condensed. We need to uh, pay attention to some vocabulary here and so I'll show you a pictograph of human chromosomes. Okay. So you can see um, that humans have what we call 22 autosomes and these are uh, numbered 1 through 22, so chromosome numbers 1 through 22 are autosomes. Autosomes, by definition, are chromosomes that are the same in both males and females. So the opposite of an autosome are sex chromosomes. In humans, there's the X chromosome and Y chromosome, and this is a male because we have a Y chromosome. Females have no Y, they have two X chromosomes. So autosomes, sex chromosomes, okay. and this shows only one haploid set. One copy of each chromosome is a haploid set. Okay and n equals 23, so where n is the haploid number of chromosomes. A recently developed technique, well, okay, so maybe 10 years ago, um, of chromosome painting has revealed some uh, remarkable insights into how chromosomes are organized. So chromosome painting is a technique that allows us to decorate or label 
each chromosome with a different fluorescent color. And what you see here is an interphase nucleus. So all the chromatin is in the nucleus. If this is an interphase, so they're all decondensed. Okay? But even when they're decondensed, what we see is that individual chromosomes occupy a distinct region in the nucleus. Before we had chromosome painting, we didn't know that. All right, so let's, uh, again, sticking to some, or taking care of some terminology, ploidy. So humans and most other sexually reproducing organisms are diploid, okay? meaning there are two copies of each chromosome. Okay? And so the corresponding uh, two copies of each chromosome are called a homologous pair. Okay? So two copies of the X chromosome are a homologous pair. So only females have a homologous pair of X chromosomes. Um, two copies of chromosome 1 are constitute a homologous pair. Gametic cells, the cells that make sperm and egg cells and sperm and egg cells themselves, all have just one copy of each chromosome and we call them haploid. So haploid is one copy of each chromosome. Diploid is two copies of each chromosome. Triploid is three copies of, chromos of each chromosome. Tetraploid is four copies, and so forth. Um, just a, a note of interest, uh, the huge strawberries that you get from the grocery store are octoploid, and that's part of the reason that they're so large. Yeah. So all of these, if they have complete sets, are called euploid. Okay. U meaning uh, nice and complete. The opposite of euploid then is aneuploid. Okay. So aneuploidy refers to a, a state where a cell it may be, uh, has an incomplete set of chromosomes. It may be missing a chromosome, or it may actually have an extra copy of one or more chromosomes. Okay. Um, where would you find aneuploidy in nature? Well, it's an aberrant state. It's a pathological state. Um, we often find that cancer cells are aneuploid. Now let's go on to the eukaryotic cell division. So prokaryotic cell division was pretty simple. It's all fission. Uh, eukaryotic cell division is more complicated. And before we actually get into cell division, let's talk about a cell division cycle. This figure shows a cell division cycle, sort of uh, like a clock. You can see it proceeding clockwise around a circle. The eukaryotic cell division cycle is really defined by two stages. One is called the S phase, and the S phase, S stands for synthesis, and the S phase is the period during which the cell is replicating its nuclear DNA. Then um, opposite S phase, as shown here in this figure anyway, but it doesn't have to be directly opposite, but the other uh, hallmark or marker of the cell division cycle is the actual cell division itself, the period of mitosis. Okay. Then yeah. when after mitosis ends, but before the cell begins to replicate its DNA, this intervening period is called the G1. G1 stands for gap one. So it's the first gap period after mitosis and before DNA replication begins. After DNA replication is complete and before the cell actually begins to divide is the gap two period or G2. So G1 and G2 are defined as the periods between the end of mitosis and beginning of DNA synthesis and G2 as the period between the end of DNA synthesis and the beginning of cell division. 
Here's another way to look at a cell division cycle. How can you tell what phase of the cell division cycle a particular cell is in? Well, one way is to look at the DNA content in the cell. If it has a diploid amount of DNA in the nucleus, it must be in G1. If it has a, a tetraploid, it has, if it has twice as much DNA, this must be in G2 because it must have replicated its DNA. If it has some amount of DNA that's in the uh, between 2x and 4x, the diploid and a tetraploid amount of DNA, then it must be somewhere during S phase. Okay, so we have G1, S, G2. And then if the cell is beginning to reduce its DNA, this is the actual cell division phase. Although I kind of think that instead of a slope, it should be more like a cliff. Uh, and then it's back to G1 again. More terminology. You often think about chromosomes, or you've been led to uh, think about chromosomes or visualize chromosomes as these highly condensed X-type figures. So we'll stick with that for now. Um, as long as you realize that chromosomes exist in the state only in what we call prophase, that is the early stages of mitosis or meiosis, the early stages of cell division when the chromosomes are fully condensed. During all of the rest of the time, if we go back to this picture, all of the period shown in blue is called interphase, where the chromatin does not exist in a, in a condensed state. Chromosome condensation begins before the cell actually be, uh, uh, divides, so it will be at the uh, end of interphase. Uh, the, the transition from interphase to mitosis is when we would get chromosome condensation. So this X-shaped figure means that the chromosome has actually replicated. Okay? So if we divide this X-shaped figure along this long axis, one of these is called a chromatid, and this is one very long DNA molecule. The other one, its partner, is also another chromatid, and these two that are joined together like this are called sister chromatids. So sister chromatids are genetically identical. because they have been produced by a chromatid undergoing DNA replication. So as long as DNA replication was error-free, the two copies, the two chromatids, the sister chromatids that are joined together, should be genetically identical. They should have identical DNA sequences. So a chromatid has one double-stranded DNA molecule, and its sister chromatid has an identical double-stranded DNA molecule. So they're genetically identical. They are joined together at this constriction called the centromere. The centromere is a special place in the uh, uh, chromatid uh, uh, where microtubules join and help move the chromosomes around during cell division. Okay, so we've been talking about mitosis. Mitosis is the cell division that generates all of your bodily cells, okay? all except for those cells that are set aside to produce eggs or sperm cells. Okay? Those are germline cells. So all your cells, other than your germline cells, arose from a single fertilized egg through the process of mitosis. The purpose is to generate daughter cells that are genetically identical to the parent. And the mechanism makes sure that each daughter cell gets one copy of each chromosome. 
So if we go back to this picture then, at the after uh, S phase, DNA replication, and as the cells prepare to divide, the chromosomes condense and they form these nice compact figures that make it easy to push them around the cell. Okay. So these replicated chromosomes now line up at the middle of the cell, what's called the metaphase plate of the cell. So this is a diagram that helps us uh, uh, talk about it more easily. So every chromosome, uh, so in, hum in your cells you would have 46 chromosomes because you're a diploid and you have two copies of each chromosome. All 46 chromosomes will look like these X figures and they're all lined up in the middle of the plate. And what then happens is that all of these X figures split into these chromatids. So the sister chromatids go to opposite poles. So for every chromosome, every chromosome divides down the middle, sends one sister chromatid to one pole and the other sister chromatid to, to the other pole. So then when the cell divides, each daughter cell gets one sister chromatid from every chromosome. And that's a, a way of making sure then that the two daughter cells are genetically identical both to each other and to the parent. And what this shows is that microtubules are the primary mechanism that uh, provides the motive force to push chromosomes. They both push and pull chromosomes um, first to the middle of the uh, cell and then to the opposite poles. So here we see uh, this could be a, a mammalian cell, most eukaryotes. What we see is that the nuclear envelope actually dissolves um, as the cell prepares to divide. So there is no nuclear envelope and you see these microtubules and they're pulling apart uh, the sister chromatids to opposite uh, parts of the cell. And eventually what will happen is that the cell membranes will form in the middle right, to separate the two cells. There are some uh, eukaryotic uh, cells where the nuclear envelope stays intact. Okay? And what we see is that the microtubules form within the nucleus and we get uh, uh, division of cells and division of the nuclear envelope. And then there are still some other cells right, where the, uh, not only does the nuclear envelope not uh, dissolve it and remain intact, but the chromosomes are actually attached to the nuclear envelope. Right? Instead of having microtubules attached to the uh, centromeres of the chromosomes, the chromosomes are attached to the nuclear envelope and you, you, this is kind of equivalent to almost a bacterial fission because if you recall in bacterial fission uh, the chromosomes are attached to the plasma membrane and when the plasma membrane um, separates the two cells the two chromosomes um, go along. Here it's almost the same situation or an equivalent situation where the chromosomes are attached to the nuclear envelope um, when the nuclear envelope um, divides then that causes separation of chromosomes. So this just kind of gives you a, a, some idea that maybe the, the wonderfully complex uh, series of events um, that comprises uh, mitosis in most eukaryotic cells may have had some evolutionary intermediates. So that's really about all I want to say about mitosis. Now let's focus on meiosis. How is it different from mitosis? Well, the purpose of mitosis completely differs from uh, well, the purpose of meiosis completely differs from mitosis because the purpose of meiosis is to have sex. You can't have sex without meiosis, and you can't have 
uh, well, I mean, there would be no reason for meiosis if there were no sexual reproduction. So meiosis is all about sex, and it is sex, essentially. Yeah. So let me show you what I mean. So you started out life when a sperm cell fertilized an egg cell, right? So the sperm cell contained one N set of chromosomes, and the egg contained one N chromosomes. And as a result, you got a 2N individual. And then this divides by mitosis, and you get a person. Okay. But during the uh, process of mitosis, as this becomes billions and trillions of cells, some of these cells that form early on get set aside go to our gonads and are set aside as germline cells. So when we reach sexual maturity, uh, these germline cells undergo meiosis. Okay. So since, and during meiosis then, we want to produce sperm cells and egg cells. Okay. All our body cells are 2N, Sperm cells and egg cells are one end, so meiosis, the purpose one of the purposes of meiosis then is to reduce ploidy. So we want to get back down to one end ploidy, haploid. Okay. A second purpose is to generate genetic diversity. We no longer want to in uh, meiotic cell division generates uh, cells that are identical to each other or identical to the parent. What we want to do is generate cells that are as diverse as possible genetically. And you will see that the mechanism of meiosis promotes genetic diversity. Okay. So first of all, meiosis um, to get to haploid cells undergoes two cell divisions. Um, so, before meiosis can happen, cells have to replicate their chromosomes. Okay, so they undergo an S phase and they replicate their chromosomes, so every chromosome now is double. Okay. So then, uh, to get down to a 1N cells with one N, uh, you have to have two divisions. So meiosis right away then is different from mitosis because meiosis involves two uh, uh, successive divisions, whereas mitosis has only one. Okay. It's the first division where all of the really interesting stuff happens as far as sexual reproduction is concerned. Okay. As we enter the first division of meiosis, the chromosomes condense, okay. and then what happens is that the homologous chromosomes find each other. Okay. They pair up, and they align um, all along their lengths very precisely. And there is even, a, a, uh, for a period of time, they're kind of glued together, and that's uh, called synapsis. They form a synapse. Okay. So what this means is that uh, if you're a woman, the, the two copies of chromosome X find each other. Okay? So they're already doubled up. They've already duplicated, so you know, they consist of pairs of sister chromatids. But then one X chromosome will find the other X chromosome, and they will line up precisely okay, all along their lengths, okay, from, from one tip to the other tip. Okay? They're, both of their copies of chromosome one will do the same. And their copies of chromosome 22 will do the same thing. Okay? So in fact, when you get these things lined up like this, there is now four chromatids. There's two sister chromatids on each homologous chromosome. Okay? Now for males, the X chromosome pairs up with the Y chromosome. So they can't really line up because the chromosomes are different, but they still pair up. 
So here, the homologous chromosomes find each other in synapse. This does not happen in mitosis. In mitosis, the two copies of the X chromosome don't bother to find each other. They just line up wherever they want to, as long as it's in the middle of the cell. Okay. So what's the purpose of the homologous chromosomes lining up and, and pairing? Okay. One is that they can, once they've lined up like this precisely, they can decide to swap parts of their chromosomes. Okay. And, and we'll talk about that um, a bit more uh, in a subsequent slide. Okay. They all, all of these uh, tetrads, you know, the, the figures with four cro chromatids, the pairs of homologous chromosomes, they all line up at metaphase, kind of like in mitosis. But whereas in mitosis, uh, remember, in mitotic divisions, what happens is that each of these uh, pairs of sisters' chromatids split. Okay? The sister chromatids separate. That doesn't happen in the first division of meiosis. In the first division of meiosis, the uh, sister chromatids that are joined together stay joined together. And instead, what happens is that the homologous chromosomes separate. So the sister chromatids stay together, but the homologous chromosomes separate. Okay. So we define this as a reductional division. Okay. So at this point, even though each daughter cell okay, now kind of has sort of 2N DNA content because it has, you know, uh, one end set of chromosomes, but each set of chromosomes is still uh, doubled up uh, because it's been replicated and therefore still has DNA content. Since the two sister chromatids are genetically identical, okay, they are now genetically haploid. So in terms of genetic information, they have essentially just one copy of each uh, uh, and genetic uh, information because the joined sister chromatids are mostly genetically identical. Yeah? So in this first division is what we call a reductional division, and this first division is where the daughter cells already become haploid. Yeah? So here is a, a, a diagram um, so thinking back then to how you were first created, let us suppose then that the blue chromosomes, so this is a pair of homologous chromosomes, yeah, they're sister chromatids joined at the centromere, and let's say that the blue chromosomes came from the sperm, okay, so, so your, uh, these are your paternal chromosomes. You inherit the, this chromosome from your father. Let's say that the red chromosomes came from the egg, Okay. And so these would be the maternal chromosomes. So these are the chromosomes that you inherited from your mother. So your maternal and paternal copies of each chromosome are joined together. And remember, this is still in prophase 1. Okay. So the no Roman numeral after uh, the name of the uh, phase of meiosis refers to the whether it's the first division or the second division. So if it's the Roman numeral one, this is uh, prophase of the first meiotic division. Okay. So they're synapsed here. Okay. And then they're undergoing recombination. So we can actually see recombination under the microscope. Um, it looks like these uh, chromosomes are exchanging legs. Their, their legs are kind of crossed over. Um, and so we call that a crossing over. And what that represents that is that uh, when these crossovers are resolved, there's actually physical breakage and rejoining yeah, of, of chromosomal material. Yeah. So as a result of recombination then, we, we end up with chromatids that are recombinant, meaning they now have a new combination of maternal and paternal genes. Okay. 
So these recombinant chromatids have new combinations of maternal and uh, paternal genes. And these crossovers can happen essentially anywhere along the chromosome. Okay? So some, in some uh, meiotic cells, crossing over will occur here. Uh, in other meiotic cells, you might have a crossing over here. Uh, still other meiotic cells, you might have crossing over closer to the tip. So you can get lots and lots of different recombinations. So all of this is a, promotes genetic diversity by giving us new combinations of maternal and paternal genes. Oh, uh, the other thing that, um, I, that is not being shown here is that here we're looking at just one chromosome. Okay? What if there is another chromosome, uh, let's say a, a smaller one? So this is a, a, a second pair of chromosomes. Yeah. So in the first division, yeah, one cell gets the blue chromosome, um, the other cell, okay, so let's go. In the first division, one cell gets the blue chromosome, the other cell gets the uh, red chromosome. Yeah. But what about the second chromosome? Well, there's the, the way that uh, the second pair of chromosomes separates is completely independent of the way that this chromosome separated. Okay? So we can get different combinations where one cell can get the maternal copy of the large chromosome and the paternal copy of the small chromosome, or another cell could get maternal copies of both chromosomes, uh, and, and so forth. So if there are uh, 23 chromosomes, there are uh, approximately 2 to the 23rd different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes. All right, so after the first division then, we have cells that have received one copy of each chromosome. So these are the daughter cells after the first division. And then each cell will divide again. Now in the second division, this is pretty much like mitosis in that the sister chromatids separate. So as a result, we'll end up with four cells, each containing only one chromatid for each chromosome. Okay. So this is very much like mitosis. So this figure then uh, wraps up our discussion of meiosis, uh, looking at what happens in the DNA content. So before meiosis, before meiosis begins, we get DNA replication. So the chromosomes are replicating. And then we have premeiotic or meiotic prophase. right in here. Okay. This is when all the interesting stuff is happening. Um, the homologous chromosomes are lining up. And it's first of all, you, the chromosomes are condensing. Then the homologous chromosomes are finding each other here. Uh, they're crossing over and swapping uh, uh, segments of chromosomes between the homologous pairs and, and creating new combinations of maternal and paternal genes. Okay. And then and this is the first reductional division. And as I said, at this point, the cells are now already genetically haploid. Okay. So they have 2N DNA content, but genetically they are haploid okay, because they consist of all the chromosomes are uh, cystic chromatids still joined together. Okay. Then we have the second division, and now we have cells with one end, and these will be our gametes.
So I would like you to sort of review uh, the major points and the major differences between mitosis and meiosis and I will help you do that in class.